So as we're looking at Romans chapter 12, it talks about the people of God that we're called to be in the midst of the earth. We're called to be a people who are distinct. We're called to be a people that are distinguishable from other people who do not know our God, who have not experienced his mercy to this point. We have a different master that we're following in step with. We have a different mandate to love our God with everything we are and all that we have and to love one another as Jesus Christ has loved us and to even love those who are our enemies because God loved us while we were yet enemies, that we have a different mission, that we're to be on his mission, that we're to be walking with him and pursuing all that he's called us to be, to take the good news of who he is and what he's done to all nations of the world, and we have a motivation that's different from anybody else's motivation, that it's not a selfish motivation, that our motivation is to please our king. Our motivation is that in everything we do, we want to do it for his glory. We want him to be seen. We want him to have center stage. We want it to be about him because it's his show that he's working in history. It's his story that God is working out for his glory. So our lives are to reflect that in the midst of this world. So let me read our scripture for today. And I want to talk about living in unity and in the fact that it is so much bigger than me. So Romans 12, 16 again reads, to live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. So in the midst of a world where there's a lot of conflict and wars and strife and tension, Paul says we are to live in harmony with one another. And when I think of him saying to live in harmony with one another, that can only be done, I think, among those who know Christ. And that will affect the way we relate to those who don't know Christ. But there's a harmony that we can have with one another. Do you know that all those that are Christ are members of his body? It's one body, but we're various members. Each of us have a part to play in, what, in God's program and his kingdom agenda in the earth. Each of us have an individual part to play, but we are members of that body and we are members who are to work together so that people see the one who is the head and we are members of one another. We are members that are connected together for the purposes of God and for his pleasure. There's great diversity among the members. There's different gifts that we have. There's different callings that we have. There's different economic statuses that we have. There's, there's different political preferences that we have. There's different cultural backgrounds that we come from. There's different racial and ethnic backgrounds that we find ourselves from. Each of us in this room, we find ourselves with different educational attainments. We have different interests. We have different hobbies. There's a lot of diversity. And you know what the natural tendency of the world is, is to esteem the things that are about me more highly than I esteem anything about any, anyone else. So with that being the case, there's something that we need to guard against as the people of God. We have to guard against just wanting to be around others who are like us, who have the same interests we have, who may be in the same economic status that we have, who, who maybe have the same hobbies that we have, who are the same color that we have, who speak the same language that I speak. It can be the natural tendency to just want to cluster into our various groups and be in our segmented silos, even as Christians. But if we would choose to live that way, it would actually cause discord in the church. It would actually cause the church to be uh, looking like they're divided when we're actually not divided. We have a unity that we have in common because of Jesus Christ and what he's done. That Jesus Christ, through his death, he has brought us into God's kingdom and his resurrection. He has brought us into God's kingdom and he has brought us into God's family. And as believers in Christ, our greatest thing about our identity is Christ. The greatest thing about my identity is not the fact that I'm a black man. The greatest thing about my identity is that I am a Christian. And because I am a Christian and I am in Christ, Christ should dictate the way I live as being black and as being a man. It should dictate that. So Christ becomes the, the thing that the, the source of the believer's identity. We are to live. We have a new identity in Christ. We're to live in the spirit of unity and harmony with one another despite our differences. And when we do that, Christ is more clearly experienced by us, and he's more clearly seen through us by others. Jesus is the source of the Christian's harmony. 
It would be like an orchestra or a band that's composed of various instruments. You got the woodwinds, you got the strings, and maybe if it's an orchestra, you got the strings if it's an orchestra, you got the brass, you got the ones that play the low notes, you got the ones that play the high notes, you got the ones that play bass clef and treble clef, you got those who play at different speeds and have different notes, and all of them playing can make different sounds, but those sounds alone, they can sound okay, and if they're playing without someone leading and conducting them, it could sound like a mess, but we have the same conductor, Jesus, who has called us to play the same song together, and when we play that same song together, bringing together our various parts, it sounds glorious, and we follow the lead of the conductor so that the song can be a song that's melodious and brings glory to him. Jesus is the source of our unity. Ephesians 2 talks about, as Paul is writing this church, he's writing to a church that's filled with Jewish and Gentile believers. And there's a lot of differences between them. There's some religious differences. There's some ethnic differences. There's some historical differences. (coughs) There's some strife that they have experienced between one another historically. There are a lot of differences between these individuals. But Paul wrote in another letter that Jesus became their peace, that the wall of hostility that was between them, Jesus caused that to be torn down. He took these two different people groups and he made them one new humanity through their faith in Christ, that God reconciled them together in a way to show forth the reality of his great power, that there's nothing that is too great for him to overcome so that they could be a people to show forth the reality of God in the midst of the world that they're living in. In Ephesians 4, verse 3 through 6, it says, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace, that we as the people of God are to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. The Spirit has brought us into a unity because of our faith in Jesus Christ, and we're to make every effort to walk in that unity that is ours by faith. He says there's only one body. If you're a Christian, there's one body that we're a part of, and that body is Christ. And there's one spirit that enlivens every individual member of that body. Just as you were called to one hope, we have the same hope That hope of being one day with our glorious Savior in his presence, having a new body and a new heavens and a brand new earth, being in the glory of our King, we have the same hope at your calling. We have one Lord Jesus. We have one faith. And it's by that one faith in Jesus Christ that has made us right with God. Nothing we have done, just believing in him has made us right with him. We have one baptism that we've been baptized by the one spirit into this one body in our identification. The uniform that we wear is Jesus. The uniform that we wear as the people of God is the uniform of Christ in the world. We have one God who is made up of three persons. There's a diversity in our God, but there's a unity in this one singular God in three distinct persons who is the father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. That God wants us to live in this world in a harmony that will cause people to recognize and to know that there is a different way that they can live. That there is one who can bring peace. That there is one who can bring an end to the conflict in the relationships between people groups who at one time may have hated one another, but who now have been bathed in the love of God and who can now love one another because God loved us while we were sinners and his enemies and he brought us into the fold so there is not any that we should look at as being our enemies when God has reconciled us to himself and when they're a brother and a sister in Christ we are members of the same family we are members of the same household we are citizens of the same kingdom all those other things that we want to put up on high levels don't mean anything compared to that they will fade away with heaven and earth our political preferences will fade away The way we think about immigration is going to fade away. The way we think about critical race theory is going to fade away. Even the way we think about things like abortion will fade away. But what will remain is Jesus and his glory will remain forever. In John 17, Jesus says, may they all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. 
I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be made completely one. So that the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. You know what? We always, you know, often we can go out and share and and we want to have all the right answers to give people if they were to ask us. You know, oftentimes we don't share our faith because we're just afraid sometimes. I don't know what to say. But you know what Jesus says is the great apologetic that will let the world know that the Father sent him into the world? It's when we, the people of God, who come from different ethnic backgrounds and racial backgrounds and economic social statuses, when we, the people of God, are living as one and living in complete unity, that will be a statement to the world that the Father sent the Son and that he loves us even as he loved him. The statement to the world is how we walk in harmony as to whether or not the reality of Christ is true. The world is walking around doubting whether or not Jesus is really who he is because they see a church that lives just like they live. We're divided by the different issues in our day. We're divided by CRT. We're divided by our estimations of history. We're divided over immigration. We're divided over Trump and Biden. We're divided over all of these different things. And they look at us and we don't look any different than the world. And we forget that we have a greater uniform to stand behind. And it's Christ. And the reality is that God wants to use us to show to the world who they need. They don't need to be one of... When we think of the world when it comes to this, it's the culture world wars. And we're like, we got to win them over to abort. We got to win them over to abort. And you know what? I'm a pro-life advocate, so I, I, I want every law in the United States of America to ban abortion because it's an injustice to the smallest citizens in our country. But we approach our world with the culture wars. You know, there are people that agree with me on abortion that don't know Jesus. The greatest need of people in our world isn't being on the right side of abortion. It's being right with God. And we spend so much time arguing over issues that we actually alienate people from the very thing we're called to bring to them. Their greatest need is Jesus. If they don't know him, they are lost and they're headed to hell. Actually, the worst thing that can happen to a man or woman is not that they have an abortion. The worst thing could happen to them is that they die without Jesus and they are separated from God. We're arguing to people about gender issues. We're arguing them, trying to get them to be on the right page. I totally agree. God created male and he created female. God created. What causes people to think different is that sin has distorted our hearts and distorted our minds. But I'm not going to spend time arguing with an unbeliever about Male or female, because their greatest need isn't to embrace male or female. Their greatest need is Jesus. I'm one who was complicit in an abortion. It wasn't that somebody talked to me and got me on the right side of the pro-life movement. It was the fact that Jesus Christ invaded my heart. He began to change my mind and change my heart. He took the scales off of me. He opened up my eyes to see the reality of life and all of its beauty and the creator of life and life created by him and how valuable it is. What we need to do is to make sure that Jesus is the issue, not immigration. I don't need to argue with people about Trump. And Trump isn't bringing God's kingdom. God's kingdom is only hitched up to one, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not hitched up to Biden or Trump. When Jesus comes back, he's not riding on an elephant or a donkey. He's riding on a white horse, and he's not coming to take sides. He's coming to take over. You need to stop arguing about immigration and critical race theory and, and abortion with unbelief. Keep arguing and arguing and arguing. Do we realize their state If they don't know Jesus, they are blinded by the devil. They are slaves of sin. They've been taken captive by the devil to do his will. What they need is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only source of hope and salvation for the non-Christian. And will we be a people like Paul in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 who says we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. Will we, if we're going to offend people, 
let our offense be with the gospel. If, if we're going to offend people, let it be with the gospel because Jesus is able to take a, a bruised reed and he's able to heal it. We got to stop getting in these side arguments that are causing us to alienate people from the one true message they need. From the one true thing they need, they need Jesus Christ. They don't need to be on the right side of an issue. They need Jesus. And when Jesus catches people, Jesus cleans them. Let Jesus, we see people in history, John Newton. John Newton was the captain of a slave ship. What changed him? Jesus Christ got a hold of his heart and changed his life. And that man made that song, Amazing Grace. I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. And he became a mentor to William Wilberforce, who brought forth the, the, the end of the slave trade in England. Paul himself was on the wrong course. What changed him? Meeting Jesus and having his eyes open to the reality of that. Abby Johnson, who many of you may know from the movie Unplanned, she was leading a Planned Parenthood, and she was leading uh, many babies to their death and many women to hurtful things, but she had an encounter, and things have changed, and she's turned around. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. So we don't be proud. The next point is don't be proud. It's not about you. You know, we can be in this world and we can almost become proud. You know, we can think I'm in and, and they're not. Well, you didn't do anything to get yourself in. It's not about you. It's always about God. It's not looking at myself in comparison to others and looking at them and saying, they're doing this and they are so far gone. It doesn't matter what they are doing or what I've done because James says that if you only missed one part of the law, you've been guilty of breaking all the law. So none of us are better than anyone else. And we keep looking on the wrong level. We keep looking to people around us and we keep looking down at them and thinking we're better than them. When the one we need to be looking at is to look at the one who is up. To look at God and to remember it's about God and to remember that it's what God has done. That we're to remember that we have a God who is seated on the throne that we serve a God who is holy, who is other than, who is separate from. We serve a God who is enthroned over all of his creation as king. We serve a God who is absolute moral purity. He is holy. He does not sin. He cannot sin. He is the utter infinite opposite of sin. He hates sin. He must judge sin and pour out his wrath on sin. You know, the question we often hear in our culture is, how can a loving God send people to hell? Well, we, we, there's another question that should be asked. How can a holy God allow anybody to come into his presence? And this God who sits high on his throne, he parted the heavens and he came down. And we take for granted that he came down into the world to save us. He had every right to come down to judge us. He had every right to come down to pour his wrath out on us for, for our sin. He had every right to do so. But this God who sits high and who is holier than our imagination, though we all deserve his wrath because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, God has made his righteousness available to all those who will believe in Jesus Christ through faith, that he left his palatial throne in glory. He came into this earth in a human body, and he never ceased being God, and he obeyed God fully all the way to the cross, not because he did anything wrong, but because there were a people that he created that he longed to experience intimacy, intimate fellowship with. And the only way that could happen is if he did away with our sin. And that's what he did when he went to the cross and he became our sin. And instead of God's wrath being poured out on us, it was poured out on him. And he drank every cup of God's wrath, every drop of the cup of God's wrath, he drank it down to the very last dregs which means he didn't leave a drop in the cup for you, for you to have to drink. He paid for all of your sin. He died for all of your sin. You only can stand forgiven and righteous in the sight of God because of Jesus Christ and what he has done. The fact that he died for your sin and he was raised from the dead so that you might be declared right with God. And we need to remember that we're not better than anyone else. I don't need God's mercy and grace any less than any other person in this world. The only thing that I have to boast about is Jesus Christ. The only thing I have to boast about is his cross. 
The next thing is associate with the humble. That we have to realize that there are none who are below us. That there's no one who is below us. See, we live in a world that has different levels of status. The world judges people based on how much money they make, how many houses they have, how big their house is, what kind of car they drive, how much popularity they have, what kind of degrees they have behind their name. And and you know what? Because that's true, people spend their time and their efforts trying to get in with those who can benefit them, with those who would be of this type of level. I know this. When I was in college, I went to college and I didn't play football, but I realized the football players went to the best parties and they had the prettiest girls hanging around them. So what I began to do is my best friends became football players because I was thinking if I get around them, it's going to benefit my life. And I didn't want to be around the lowlier people who didn't go to the good parties and hang around with the pretty girls. And that even has affected me as being a Christian. Uh, For a while, I thought my greatest role in ministry was the fact that I had the privilege to be a chaplain for an NFL team, as if the status of these men made my ministry any more prestigious because I was looking at things in a worldly fashion, that we are to look at things different. We are to be willing to associate with the humble and realize that there are none below us. So there are no statuses in the eyes of God. All are created in his image and in his likeness. And what gives value to every single human being is that intrinsic truth that gives us intrinsic value that we are created in the image of God. God isn't impressed by the number of titles that you have behind your name. God isn't impressed by how much money that you have because he could say, you fool, tonight your life is required of you. God doesn't care how many likes you have on Instagram or how many followers you have on YouTube. He doesn't care about those things. He doesn't care if you're a TikTok influence or not. It doesn't mean anything to God. But we get caught up on things that actually don't mean much in light of eternity. And that's why I think Paul said at the beginning of this chapter, don't be conformed to this world. Because the world will make you think that that's what you need to be going after and that's what you need to be living for. Don't be conformed by the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Learn the way that God values things. Learn the way that God sees things. Live in the way that God has called us because the ways of God, the commandments of God, the word of God are the words of life. We've gotten to the place to think that God's the great killjoy. God is not the great killjoy. God is the one who gives joy. God is not the one who takes away the life of the party. God is the only one who can give life to the party because he's life himself. And it's only by walking with him in his ways and in his truth by the power of his spirit that you can experience life at its fullness. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. The world loves the status and running after the things. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. John is writing to a people to remind them that there are things that keep you from walking in intimacy with God. And you can't walk in intimacy with God if you're loving the world or you're following the world's way of doing things. God's love can't come forth from you. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, me feeling good about the things that I do, the lust of the eyes, me running after the things that cause people to get big-eyed, and the pride in one's possessions, the things that make me feel prideful about what I have, that's not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. The things the world cares about means nothing in light of eternity. The things that the world value mean nothing in light of eternity. And they keep us from enjoying the love of the Father now in time as we're marching through on our way to be with him. God wants, it, wants us to make a regular part of our lives to connect with the humble. God wants us to make a regular part of our lives to connect with the humble. The humble are those who have nothing to give back. And not just to connect with them for charity. Not just to connect with them because we're giving to them, but to associate with them. To realize that we are one with them, especially those who who are humble, who know Christ, we are one with them. It doesn't matter what they have and what they don't have because they have Christ. And Christ is everything and he is all in all. So we we can gravitate and hang with those 
who are humble, who have nothing to give back. When it comes to other Christians, do you realize there's no big eyes and there's no little U's in the body of Christ? That every Christian has these things that are true about us. We're created in the image of God. We've all been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. It's the same price God paid to buy us to belong to himself. We are all indwelt by the same Holy Spirit. We are all adopted into the same family, and God is all our Father. We are all heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We have the same inheritance coming with Jesus, that we all have the same hope of heaven. And it doesn't matter how much money's in your bank account or if your bank account has no money in it. All of these things are true for those of us that are in Christ. And the money in our bank account will fade away. But all of these things will remain forever and ever and ever. When we see the physical needs of our brothers and sisters and those outside of the body of Christ. You know, it's good for us to be around those who don't have much in the world. You know why? Because when we see their physical needs, you ever seen somebody who, who is really, really hungry or really, really thirsty and they're really, really desperate? They are crying out. They have a desperation to have their needs satisfied. God wants us to be around people like that. You know why? Because it reminds us of our deep and desperate need for him. We have a spiritual need for God that is just that great. Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount, That blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they who realize you bring nothing to the table. Because yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when you realize that you're bankrupt and you need God every single day. Blessed are you when you're totally dependent on him. Because that's the only way that you can live. See, we need to be brought to the place to be reminded of how desperate we are for God. That just like the beggar on the street may be desperate for a piece of physical bread, that we are desperate daily for the manna of his word. We are desperate daily for the filling of his Holy Spirit. We are desperately needy daily for the communion among the saints of God. We are desperately needy for our God. He has given me a life to live that I'm not able to live apart from him. He came that I might have life and have it more abundantly. But there's no way that I can live the life he's given me without him. Jesus says in John 15, 5, that I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I am him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Are we a people that recognize that? Are we a people that realize that apart from him creating me, I don't even exist? Apart from him giving me life that I am dead in my transgressions and sins and deserving of his wrath. Do I realize that apart from his spirit filling me that I can't do anything he's called me to do in my own strength and effort and ability, that I am daily desperate for him? And when it comes to hanging around those who are outside of Christ, you know what it reminds us of? It reminds us of Jesus. It reminds us of the king of glory who shared glory with his father from before the creation of the world. It reminds us of the one who is the image of the invisible God, who would leave from the glory of heaven and come into this earth. He was worshiped by angels in heaven, and he came into a world where he was blasphemed by men. The holy God entered into the world, veiling himself with flesh so that his glory would not kill us. And the one who is so glorious that no sin could be in his presence would veil himself in human flesh so that he could hang out with sinners because every person on planet earth was a sinner. The 12 that walked with Jesus, they were sinners. The prostitutes and the tax collectors, they were sinners. The religious leaders were sinner. Everybody Jesus bumped into was a sinner and everybody was so low compared to him. But he would lay aside his privilege. He would take off his kingly robes. He would wrap himself with a servant's towel and he would come to serve humanity that hit, didn't serve him. That Jesus wants us to serve this world. The world hated him and Jesus still came into the world to serve it. The world hates us, and God still wants us to serve the world. He still wants us to take Jesus to them and to be among them as Jesus came among us. Lastly, do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not seek great things for yourself. 
as the people of God, we are not to seek great things for ourselves. You know, most people act like they know what they're doing in life. You know, I feel like sometimes I'm the only one that don't know what I'm doing. Because everybody act like they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing and they know what's best for their lives. And they got these plans and they have these agendas and they have all of these different things and they are working it the best they can. And that's what they let us see on social media. But we don't see the anxiety. We don't see the stress. We don't see that they're breaking down under the pressure because they really don't know what they're doing. They're kind of faking it until they're making it. And God doesn't want us to go along with that program. We don't have to go along with that program. You know, if we're honest, we don't have a clue. And most people, if they're honest, they don't have a clue. But it's the pressure to keep it up. It's the pressure to keep up the image. It's the pressure for those that keep getting likes or keep getting all these different things. It's the pressure. It's the pressure. So I can't crack and I got to look like I know what I'm doing. And in the midst of this young generation, the pressure of that is leading too many of our young people to suicide and depression because there's this tendency to act like you know what you're doing and your life needs to be in order and everybody else's life look like in order but my life's not in order so I might as well chuck it because I can't do it but the reality is nobody knows what they're doing nobody does and we're a people that don't have to fake it and God doesn't want us to fake it God wants us to show to the world the genuineness of what life is all about see I don't know what I'm doing I'll be honest with you I have no idea what I'm doing When I was younger, I thought I knew what I was doing, but I have no idea. People will ask me to get on radio programs, and I'm like, I don't want to get on a radio program because I don't know what I'm going to say, and I don't want people to think I'm an expert because I'm not. I got people to say, will you do a blog, and it's like, I really, or a podcast, I don't really want to do a podcast because I don't want people thinking I'm an expert, and I don't really know what I'm doing. People say, David, why don't you write a book and share your story? No, I don't want people looking at me to think that I'm some type of expert. I don't know what I'm doing. And you, if you're honest, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know, but that's okay. You know why it's okay? Because we have a God who has a plan for our life. He has a plan for our life. I think of those words that, that, that Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 29, 11, and he wrote it to a people who had been disobedient to God. He wrote it to a people who found themselves in exile because of their disobedience to God. He wrote it to a people who maybe thought that our run with God is over and God sends them a message and says, I know the plans I have for you. And I want you to know no matter where you are, what you've done, God has plans for you. You're not just some arbitrary being in the earth that God is wanting you to figure out what to do with your life. God has plans for your life. When he wrote in the beginning of Jeremiah, he says, before I formed you and placed you in your mother's belly, I knew you. Before you came out of the womb, I appointed you for a task to be a prophet. When God, before he formed you in your mother's belly, God knew you. God knew he put gifts and talents and abilities in you to do things in the earth that nobody else can do. God made you and formed you. God knows you better than anybody else. He knows you better than the mother whose womb he formed you in. He knows you better than your best friend who you've shared all your secrets with. God knows you. He knows what he created you to be. He knows you. He knows the plans he has for you, plans that are good. Not that everything in your life will be good, but God has a way of working all things together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He has plans to prosper you and Prosper you doesn't mean he's going to financially make you a millionaire. Prosper you means he will make you successful in doing the things he placed you in the earth to do. And then he says, come and pray to me. You don't know what to do? He says, I have plans. He didn't say, I'm going to let you know what the plans are. He just told you that they're good and prosperous. But then he says, come and pray to me. Come to me. I know the plans. Come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Seek me. Seek me, and you will find me if you search for me with all of your heart. We don't have to know the plan. I just have to know the one who has the plan, and I just have to walk with him. I have to call out to him, and if God's plan is to bring him glory in the earth, guess what? God wants me to fulfill his purpose for my life more than I wanted to fulfill it because God wants glory from my life more than I want to give him glory. 
And if I am seeking him, I'm not looking to what he has in his hand for me. That if he says, make me the object of your affection. Seek me. Desire me than you desire anything else. And you will find me. And with me comes the plans that I have for you. Make God your highest priority. Make him your greatest delight. Make him your greatest joy. If you do that, God in his time will make known to you the plans he has for you. Don't seek the plans. Seek the God who has the plans. And know that his plans for you are far more glorious than anything that you could imagine. When Jesus gave the disciples the prayer to pray, he was letting them know what is God's purposes and what is God's highest priority. And it's not about me. It all begins with God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name be honored as holy in all the earth. That's what's greatest on God's priority list, that his name be treated as set apart and sacred and holy in all the earth. That his kingdom would come. Not my agenda, not my plans, not my dreams, that his kingdom will come. And what he wants, his will, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's okay that you don't know what to do. Keep looking to him, seeking him, making him the priority, and God will give to you the things you need to live out his will and purpose in the earth and to play the part he's given you in this eternal family. And since that is true, continually look to God because I need him to know what to do. And I'm going to end with three practical things, and I'm going to get out the way. So daily, spend time with God in his word. Spend time with God. Many Christians trying to figure out how to live the Christian life and not cracking open their Bible. God has given us the basic instructions before leaving earth in the Bible. He's written us a love letter. He's written us a letter so we know who he is, who we are, and how we're called to live in this world. And there are so many Christians that do not open their Bible and their minds are inundated by Fox News and CNN and blogs and websites and, and the local news and the world news and movies and music. And so we're trying to live for God and we have no idea because the world's ideas have invaded our mind instead of God's words lighting up our path. God says, my word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto my pathway. God says, stay in my word and I'll give you enough light to take the next step. We want to see down the corridor. We want a five-year plan from God. And oftentimes we want that so that we can leave God and the Bible and our time with him right here so we can run off and accomplish great things for God. But God says, I'm going to give you enough light for you to take the next step. And when you take the next step where I've given you enough light, I will give you the enough light for you to take the next step. That this Christian walk is daily dependent upon him. Each and every step along the way, the Word of God has to be a priority. We sit under the preached Word of God on Sunday, but we just can't let this be our whole thing. We can't just go. I heard a guy said he used to go to uh, Costco, and he loved to go because they had the samples. And he said, you know, I'd eat those samples at Costco, but what if all I did was eat those samples on that one day? I would be a malnutrition man. And that's what many of us look like as Christians Instead of being the strong warriors for Christ who are living for his glory, we look like malnutrition Christians because we sit under his word for 30 minutes and 45 minutes, and then we live the rest of our week bombarded by the things of this world. Spend time in God's word. Spend time in prayer. And prayer is something that we don't even do and we can't do without the help of the spirit. God has given us his spirit to help us to pray. But God says in Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that we know not. Gather together with the saints and pray. Pray together, but make sure you have time alone praying to God and make sure as you're praying to God that you're not the only one doing all the speaking because God already knows what I'm going to say before I say it. I need to be sitting still and quiet before him to hear the voice of God and when you're reading the word of God and the word of God is, is, is marinating in your heart, 
then it's easier to discern God's voice when he speaks to you and as he's leading you, as he's prompting you to do things. And then lastly, I would say the counsel from mature Christians. We don't have to gut this thing out on our own. It's okay to go to another Christian and say, you know what? I really have no clue what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Can you pray for me? Maybe can you give me some counsel? And as we're getting counsel, we want to go to those who we know have walked with God and they have endured trials and they are being matured by God's spirit into the image of Christ who are going to counsel us with words that come from God. Young people who have godly parents, your parents are those that God wants to use on your journey as you walk out the way that God has called you to go. So live in unity, love in unity. We are to be a people who live in harmony with each other. We are to be a people who are not proud because we recognize that it's about God and we're not comparing ourselves with others. We are to be a people that realize there are none who are below us and that remember what Jesus has done to humble himself from heaven to come to this earth in order to pick us up so that we could be with him. And do not be wise in your own estimation. Don't seek great things for yourself. Seek God so that God can do great things through you that will not be for yourself. It will be for his glory. It will be for your good. It will be for the blessing of others. Now, maybe as you've heard this word, you recognize there are some areas that I've sided with worldly thinking rather than with the word of God. And what God wants you to do is not to beat yourself up. He wants you to repent. He wants you to acknowledge in this area, God, I have been living more like the world than according to your word. And I confess that to you, God. And I ask you to change my mind so that my life can go in a brand new course following you. But perhaps you're here today and you don't know Jesus, that Jesus did leave from the glory of heaven, that Jesus did come down to the earth because he longed for you to know his father that much, that Jesus did live a perfect life, one that you fail to do every day. Jesus lived it perfectly. And Jesus did go to the cross, not because he did anything wrong, but he went to the cross to bear our sin. He went to the cross to take all of our mistakes upon him, all of our sins, all of the things we've done that are against God, that are hostile to, towards God, where we've ignored God, where we thought we were God and we didn't need God. He took that, all of that upon himself and he died to pay the penalty for our sin, which is death. And because he did it all in obedience to his father, he was raised from the grave on the third day. That if you were to put your hope and your trust in Jesus, he will give you a brand new life. And he will give you the power by the spirit that he sent after he ascended to live a life that you could never live apart from God. I'm going to ask all of you to close your eyes real quick. If you recognize you're here and you don't know Jesus, but the spirit of God is moving upon your heart and you hear Jesus calling you to himself, that if it were only you, Jesus would have came to the earth to die on the cross for your sin in order to give you a right standing with God and to reconcile you into a right relationship with your father. If that's you, I'd ask you to pray a prayer with me.